up. <laughs> All right. So, hey, guys. Um, I'm Felicia Angel. Uh, this is Cliff. And uh, this is... Directing panel? Directing panel. Voice directing panel. Anime directing panel. That's yeah. what we're calling it. That's what we're saying. We're doing it. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's been a long day, but we are here for you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, let's see. Uh, it's been a good day, but our, our day, I don't know about you guys, but our day started at 10, and we've pretty much been going ever since. So, all, yeah. All since, no, it's so. been wonderful, yeah. but just brain no but do at this point, the thing. Very tiny. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, but uh, I guess we'll say a little bit about us. I uh, do voices, and I have also voice directed at Funimation. Um, Voice-wise, I actually have a handy cheat sheet here thanks to a wonderful volunteer who made us some art. I was Perona in One Piece, Emi Yusa in Devil's a Part-Timer, Akina in Danganronpa, Sayaka Miyata in in Keijo and Alex Benedetto in Gangsta, among others that you are free to Google. Um, <laughs> as a voice director, um, I AD'd for uh, some of Tokyo Ghoul, for Attack on Titan Junior High, Barakamon, um, Trickster, and I'm certain some other things. Uh, as a ADR director, I've directed Sky Wizards Academy, Chaos Dragon. I always want to say child because I just worked on that as an actor, but it's not not that one. Um, Puzzle and Dragons Cross, and oh, Grimgar Fantasy of Ash. It, that's the wrong title I'm saying now, isn't it? Grimgar Ashes and Illusions yeah. is the new one. Um, Which is the first one. Yeah. <laughs> it's the long it's story. the first one that was then changed and then became the real one again. Mm -hmm. like and uh, one. yeah, Puzzle and Dragons Cross yeah. and Kinkabancha Otome Girl Beats Boy. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Alright everybody, I'm Clifford Chapin. I uh, also do voices and direct things. Uh, voices, I voiced Connie Spring on Attack on Titan, uh, Hide in Tokyo Ghoul, Katsuki Bakugo in uh, My Hero Academia, Kaba in Dragon Ball Super, uh, among many other things that Anime News Network has uh, detailed far better than I ever will. Yes, and uh, but as an ADR director, um, I started off as an assistant ADR director to Colleen Clinkenbeard, working on Yona of the Dawn and The Rolling Girls. Um, and then uh, she stopped directing to do her producing things, and then I became a full director. I directed uh, Diamond Dollar, the rest of Yona of the Dawn, um, uh, Divine Gate, then Planetarian, Gossip, uh, Keijo, Keijo, Occupus Trip, um, Allison's Zoraku, New Game, uh, and now I'm currently directing Darling in the Franks, which is like my favorite show ever, 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 ever. Um, I've also uh, assisted and directed uh, Colleen once again on a few episodes of um, My Hero Academia. I directed several of the. Uh, no, sadly, it's your hero. So I worked on some of the uh, my, uh, Hero Killer Stain episodes and uh, some of those things around there. Um, so yeah, plenty of plenty of ADR directing up here. So yeah, and now we'll go around the room and find out what all of you guys have directed. Uh, just kidding, just kidding. Um, so yeah, uh, man. Now uh, how to do this panel? What do you think, Felicia? Uh, well, we could we could pull the audience. Uh, um, we could do a poll of the audience and see uh, if they prefer just like straight Q&A, or we could start with maybe a little rundown about the process uh, from the directorial side of our new simuldub life. And, yeah. Uh, so what do you guys think? Do you, would you like a little, a little blurb from us, or do you want to jump right into questions? Blurb. 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 Also, as we go, like you know, uh, it's not always the case at these conventions, but Cliff and I have known each other for quite a little bit, so, uh, and we're both a little tired, so things might get a little silly. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just don't want you to think we've never met before, yeah, and we're yeah. just this weird. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, how many of you, just show of hands, know about simuldubs? No, you don't. 
Okay, great. Yeah, that's a, actually a fairly better spread than I get at some of the smaller cons or with uh, younger peoples. So, um, let's see, the process of a simul dub, Clifford. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so, uh, as you guys may know, anime is made in Japan. Let's start there. I know, mind blown. I know. Uh, anime is made in Japan, uh, and uh, Funimation is a company that licenses anime from Japan so that they can distribute it in North America and other uh, territories. They've started branching into other parts of the world. Um, so the whole process, originally, we would license a show and they would, sh they would stream it on their web service and app and stuff. Subbed, subtitled, and like about nine months later, after everything was said and done, a dub would magically come out because there would have been a production uh, process of the translation being sent off to people who would time code the scripts. So every time a character's mouth opens, there would be a marker to indicate, like, at this time code, somebody's mouth opens, or they make a sound. They go, <clears throat> <laughs> like, all those little things. They do one of those, or they say an actual line, or they have narration, or any sorts of thing like that. Um, and they go through and they time code it. And then that time code script gets sent on to somebody else who's a script writer, and they take the translation and they smooth it out, because the Japanese translation sometimes can be very rough. Um, Felicia directed uh, Chaos Dragon. I was one of the ADR script writers for that, and my favorite line ever is uh, the translation of that of the show said, are you going to kill Gakusho in order to kill the person who killed Gakusho? <laughs> and I was like, that's crap. Like, that's just awful, you know? The funny thing was it was true. Yes, it's, it's a completely true statement, but like, if you don't understand the context of the yes. moment, like, that sentence is garbage. Like, so, um, so somebody's job is to then take the translation and make it sound sensible um, when spoken in English and heard in English. Um, so then someone does that, and the scripts are then sent on to uh, Funimation, or at the time it was like that, but things are changing. Uh, but the scripts would be sent on to Funimation, they'd be given to a director, and uh, the director would then have like probably like one through six, episodes one through six, and they would cast the show, do auditions, whatever they gotta do, to get out of cast, and then they would just work on all of that until they got the next six episodes, or how many episodes are in the show, um, until eventually the whole thing was produced in English, and then nine months later, after the show initially came out, there would be a cast announcement, and the show would be all done, or it'd be like in really late post-production, you know, so that it'd be like, hey, this is coming to DVD. Most of that still happens, but it's not really the same anymore. So now, the way that the simuldub works is an episode comes out in Japan, in Japanese, uh, and Funimation and Crunchyroll have a partnership going on right now that anything that Crunchyroll and Funimation both like co-license, uh, Funimation will dub and Crunchyroll will, will uh, upload the subtitled version. And so, um, so as soon as the episode airs in Japanese, some time coder gets to do the time coding script just like they did before, but only for that one episode. They're not worrying about the whole series right away like they were before. They probably would have just cranked out all the episodes at a time. Now they're going to just do the one. Yes. So they have like they have like two days to do that roughly ish. Um, and then uh, and then that gets sent on to a scriptwriter and the scriptwriter has about two days to take the translated script for this one episode and produce an English language script just like they did before. But once again it's not the entire series anymore. It's just the one episode that came out, and they have far less time to do it than they did in the old days. In the old days, they'd have like a full week to produce one episode script. Now they have two days. And so, um, so then after that, it goes through, and hopefully someone looks at it and reads it over and edits it uh, to make sure it's clean and consistent. And then it gets sent on to us uh, as the directors, and we cast any new characters that appear, um, get, you know, send off the hours we need for any actor on that episode. Um, and we send all of that to our talent coordinator. To Tara, who, uh, who does, our does the magic of scheduling 18 shows that are running at the same time that all have some varying degree of overlapping actors. Um, and different delivery dates. Yes, and like different times, like this show needs to be done by this date. 
And uh, so then once that's all done, schedule gets made, people get brought in, uh, they start doing the acting part. And that's where we're really involved, um, which is where we have seen the episode. We might have seen the next episode, if that's possible. If, if we're lucky and our timelines are lined up that way, we'll Playing that see way. at least one episode ahead of the one we're working on. Yep. And we have to guide the actors to give a performance, one person at a time, throughout the entire episode that sounds like a fluid conversation happening between multiple people as if they're all in the room together at the same time. Um, so, and then we do that whole thing. That takes 17 to 20 hours an episode, roughly. Um, and, uh, and then after that, we complete the episode, we do a review, um, we send it off. Booth review, which is different from a later review. Right. We do so. We do the booth review. We send that on to our mix engineers. Mix engineers go through and they balance all the sound and like apply filters. So it's like, okay, this guy sounds like he's talking through a radio. So like, now it needs to sound like he's talking through a radio. You know, and like they do all these sorts of effects and stuff, um, and balance music and sound effects. And then it comes back to us directors for us to do what's called a mix review. And we make all these sorts of notes like, hey, this person's footstep is really loud, or like. Yeah, the yeah, loud foot stuff. That loud one's footstep. so annoying. I'm like, what kind of floor are they on? But um, so uh, footsteps are, you know, like we notice any sort of thing, or maybe this, maybe this person's mouth sounds really spitty today. So like, we need to take out a click, or like. It's also, um, it's also an opportunity for us to um, make any notes that we need to about continuity mm -hmm. uh, between episodes, or notice any things that we may have missed during booth review. Uh, Usually, by that point, it should be small things like, oh, hey, I just noticed that person, uh, it's starting a frame late, can you move it one to the left for me, please? Yep. Um, just very minor adjustments at this point. Yep. And so, once that's all done, once the mix review's finished, we finalize it, it gets sent on to the video department so that it can go up on the website within two weeks of when it aired in Japanese for everybody's viewing pleasure. And then... <laughs> um, Anywhere between six to eight months later, we get final materials because what we've been working with are broadcast materials from Japan. It's what aired on Japanese television. Uh, so if you see anything that is a simul dub that is censored, we do not censor anything. It was censored for Japanese television. We will get final materials that, to the best of my knowledge, are always uncensored at this point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, always is a dangerous word, but for the most part. Um, we will get those final materials in. Hopefully the engineer who worked on it with us will do flap passes where he notes anything that has changed in the animation so that our lines no longer fit. He will mark those as pickups in a shared log that we can all check in and see. Uh, we will do all the pickups that we can. Um, we will do a mix review, which has now been mixed for Surround. Yep. Uh, we will mo note any pickups that we would like, get all the pickups in, you will check those pickups, and then you will send it off forever to Be quality assurance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to quality assurance, and then it will go on a DVD. Yep. Um, and that is the process of putting a show out in the age of the simul dub. Yep. Once it's on a DVD, I never want to look at it again because I know I no longer have the power to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, at that point, if you notice anything, it's just, it's just, just like that's it. That's it forever. Um, so, so yeah, that's pretty much the the rough uh, the rough rundown of it. If you're lucky, we were talking about the final mix and stuff for for DVD and stuff. Uh, uh, if you're lucky for a 12 episode show, you might have like 20 pickups. 30 pickups, you know, like, meaning we need to get new adjusted lines recorded and rewritten and stuff like that, um, which we do. The directors do those. We do the rewrites um, in the booth. Um, or you get a case like Keijo, which Keijo had over 90 uh, pickups for the 12-episode show. So, you know, all good times. For Puzzle and Dragon's Cross, over the course of our 38-week simul dub run, um, which means for 38 weeks solid, we were working on the same property one episode a week. Um, and it's not the longest running. I think right now is that going to be Black Clover? And Black I think Clover before that it was Monster Hunter Monster Rise. Was, was the same sort of deal. Yeah. Sort of four, four full seasons. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, 
Yeah, we had over the course of that five terminology changes, mm -hmm. which were things that because, and it was uh, a choice on my part that production supported, but we were already in the middle of the run, simuldub, and so I didn't want to change the terminology mid run. So instead, we got pickups and we recorded two versions of all of those pieces of terminology. And so uh, one of them was later in the run, it was a name change from uh, Sturgeon to Star John. Right. And in, gosh, I think Josh alone, Josh Greeley, had 26 Sturgeon Star John pickups. And that's one character, and it was said by, I think, 12 characters total over the course of two uh, cores, not seasons, but uh, 12 episode runs. So yeah, it can get a little hectic, but uh, that's what we do. Yep. So, the general process. I guess we will turn it over to you guys now and see if you have any questions for us about this. Oh, we got one over here. Uh, since uh, Cliff, did you have experience in film directing and voice directing? What's the big change from going from a image? Is it still sort of the same where you have control over what image is being produced versus what isn't? You have to sort of go with it? Uh, I have no control over the, the visual of the of anime. Um, however the anime comes in is exactly how it's going to go out because uh, that's that's all determined by the Japanese side of production you know and and uh, and we get that and man I wish I wish we had better relationships with the Japanese side of stuff if only because our production involvement is so um, intimate you know because we look over everything because like man I I catch continuity errors constantly like it, back when I would script write I would point out like, this person's glove is missing in this sh in this shot, you know, or like I'd be like, this person, this is a great one, you'll know it, but like I was like, this is a great one. Somebody walks into the end of an alleyway and their shadow comes in after them, like they step in and like they're done moving, and then on the wall the shadow just like follows the exact motion, but it was like way after the fact, like I mean. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, I point I point out stuff like that all the time. I catch it constantly, and I wish, just upon wish, that we could tell the Japanese side of stuff. Like, hey, there's this little continuity error, because like we care about the products. We're very, you know, we're all about it. Um, but anyway, we don't, we can't do that because uh, we don't, we don't have ownership over the property. Like we have the licensing ownership of the property, but we don't have ownership over the work itself. So unfortunately, I don't have that kind of creative power. I wish I did. Um, if only to tell someone, be like, "Hey, there's this little thing, you know, like you really want a perfect project, you gotta like, you gotta fix this thing," but you can't do it. Uh, just put the glove on her arm. Uh, but so uh, I wish. But beyond that, um, the way I think about uh, directing anime versus the way I used to think about directing for like short films and stuff like that is when I think about directing anime, you're going to hate this, but I think about it as a math problem. Uh, that's uh, why. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know anywhere you were going. That's fine. No one ever does. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think about it a lot like a math problem, is there's a lot of little pieces to the equation, and I'm working towards the sum. You know what I mean? And like, if the, the story is being told properly, the sum is going to make sense. And like... There's some little piece of, of just nuance that somebody has. Um, I can give two really good examples of this, and they're very minor, but like, it's amazing the intuition you develop uh, for directing anime. Um, two examples. One is in Occubus Trip, the animation. Um, I was playing the video game, which is not really related to the works. It's kind of similar, I guess. Um, but it's not really related, and I platinumed that game. I got every flipping trophy, so I knew every single thing I could. Um, and there's a line in the first episode that Jade Saxton's character says uh, when she's interacting with Alejandro Saab's character. Um, Alejandro says, hey, lady, I'm just here looking for my sister. And her line was, your sister? With a question mark. That's it. That's all there is to it. I have no subtext for anything. And I went... Hey, Jade, when you say this, I want you to say this as if it makes you think about a sister that you have that you haven't seen in years. <laughs> and she was like, okay. And it's like the subtlest change is that she goes, your sister? Like this very, very minor tweak. And then in episode 10, Felicia shows up as 
her twin sister. <laughs> her estranged twin sister, who they no longer get along with because Jade betrayed Grandma. That's the story. Jade Grandma. Oh, you went there. Uh, so, like, Sorry. just this, like, minor little detail that I'm look, but I was looking for that part to get to the sum. You know what I mean? Another one is in Darling in the Franks, actually. In the very first episode, Zero Two says uh, this one line where she says, I haven't seen a human cry in quite a long time. And I was like, that's important. I don't know why, but I know it's important. And, uh, and so like, I, I made Tia Ballard do a very specific read for it. And then sure enough, we get the backstory episode. Uh, and it shows it, and I was like, yes! Ah! <laughs> oh, God. Thank God that worked out, you know? <laughs> so, uh... But thank God it worked out in casting. Uh, oh, yeah, casting, the thank God it worked out in yeah. casting. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. You, sometimes you take a risk. Uh, but, yeah, so... Yeah, I guess. Does that answer your I question? I don't remember my question. It was, something about, it was something about the differences between film, dir film directing and anime directing, I think. But it's, I think I think we did it. It's late. It's fine. Good. I'm glad. I'm here for you. Thanks. <laughs> you. Yeah, uh, so, um, I'm trying to think about how to actually phrase this. Like, have you ever been into a sort of situation where like, you have cast conflicts either through sort of people not cooperating or just people falling through and how do you sort of deal with that? Um, I, I've never had someone just leave a project, like forever leave a project. Um, people do get occasionally recast and it's usually uh, either just conflict of schedule um, or there. I know one case where it just, the audition was great but it didn't work out in practical principle. Um, it wasn't my show personally, uh, but I have had situations, especially with uh, the simul dubs, where um, I knew going into puzzle to just expect to have to voice match people uh, mm -hmm. at certain points because there's no way in 38 weeks that someone isn't going to be too sick to come in or have to go on vacation or just have other work. Um, so you prepare for those eventualities. Um, on Sky Wizards uh, Academy, that was my first. Uh, with it where during the simulcast run, Megan Shipman um, had to take a leave of absence around episode 8 and um, I was lucky enough, I got Monica who was the lead writer mm -hmm. on that show at the time to just come in and she finished it for the broadcast run and as soon as we got final materials we got Megan in and that's still her character it was always her character mm -hmm. but Monica got a little pocket change and the show went on you would rock her yeah, um, Cliff stepped in for Ryan Pitts on uh, Grimgar for some very pivotal episodes. I'm very uh, happy he was able to do that, because he was also directing the same schedule as I was at the time. Um, but he came in and filled out that role. Um, we had Damon Mills step in for Dallas Reed. Um, I stepped in for Jamie for Puzzle and Dragons when she got super sick, uh, not because I thought we sounded alike, but because I was the only female in the building, and it was due the next day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. It was also, I mean, it was a character in my range, but uh, things happen, but uh, I, I can't ever think of anything as dramatic as someone saying, like, I never, I don't want to work with you anymore, you're off the show, so. Well, you know the one. But it was fine. But it was fine. Uh, I've had two interesting uh, examples of this recently, actually. Um, I had someone uh, on a show, uh, they recorded the first episode, and then as the second episode came out, before the first episode was done, as the second episode came out in Japanese, um, they watched ahead, and they became uh, uh, concerned about content. Um, if the content was going to be too mature, um, for what they like to do, um, you know, if it was going to become too vulgar or graphic, and that's like, that's a moral opposition that someone has to it, you know, and so uh, they respectfully uh, asked me if they could bow out, and we had enough time that I could get the episode one lines replaced, and, and that was that, you know, I was like, okay, I mean, I have to respect their moral, their moral choice. Um, 
and there's no hard feelings. There's no hard feelings between me or that person or or anything. Um, you know, I understand that that's their their standing, and I I have no right to judge that. You know, that's so unfortunate they were able to see the other episode. Yeah. that's not always the case, which right. can make it a, a tricky thing on the on side of the actor. Yeah. Especially with simuldubs, because we never know exactly how the story's going to go. Um, I want to say, poor Jill Harris. Um, Jill Harris is another one who she would not, she would not do mature content. Um, and one of the shows that she did the simuldub version, the simuldub version was fine. The broadcast version was fine. And I believe the home video version became way more mature. Um, they added a lot of details that weren't there and changed shots and stuff. And if she had known she wouldn't have taken the role. Um, but at that point, all 12 episodes are recorded, and so you can't really replace her on that point. You know, it's like her name's already on that project. Um, so uh, the other really interesting example I just had, I directed the second season of Silver Guardian, um, and that was a weird one because it's just a weird show in general. But um, in season one, it was directed by Jade Saxton, and uh, Jade had, had cast uh, Marissa Lenti as a particular character who in the Japanese version has the same seiyu, the same Japanese voice actress, as another character. And they look similar, but we don't know what the connection between these two characters are. Okay? And my intuition looks at that and goes, that's going to screw us like, <laughs> later if these are not voiced by the same people. You know, like there's going to be a reason that those are the same people in Japanese and why they look alike, and we need to match it. So, for season two, uh, I spoke to Marissa and I recast her. So Amber, who plays the other character, now voices the character that Marissa was doing, and Amber replaced the recordings for that character in season one, so that when it goes on the DVD, it'll be Amber consistently all the way through. And then I made it a point that when a new character showed up in Silver Guardian, I got Maris, Marissa back in on that other character to make it up to her for losing the one that she was doing. And the one that she ended up becoming, Marissa could do that role in spades, and it actually made more money than she ever would have made, than she ever made as the other character. So like, it had more recording, it had more hours and stuff like that. So it actually turned out to be way beneficial for Marissa. She got to do her own thing. We don't have to worry about whatever this continuity thing is going to be later. Um, but those are some weird ones, uh, just some weird examples of it that kind of meet your thing, but nobody's ever really like, Nobody's yeah. flipping tables and storming out. Yet. I mean, you know, not for us anyway, yeah. so. For the simuldubs, is it more difficult or challenging to simuldub a show where the episode length is actually shorter than a normal show? Like, uh, Kencha, Oh, Kankabancha? No, it's a cakewalk. Oh my <laughs> god. Except for, uh, I, uh, the nighttime director positions are contract labor, uh, which was hourly, so that was the only downside. Uh, no, it was awesome. <laughs> um, the, that show, too, uh, it had really cool, quick pacing. Um, it was funny. Uh, it had interesting characters, and like I, I just brought on people, and I was like, you there, get over here. You can totally do this one. Um, and, uh, and I had Afia Yu who uh, also makes and likes Otome games, and so I had her brain in there as the lead character. It's, it was so much fun, and it was, it was a nice little light assignment after 38 weeks of Puzzle and Dragons. So, yeah, it was great. I can't even, I can't even pretend that was more challenging. It might be on something um, that, I guess, uh, leaves more open-ended questions or doesn't have uh, readily available source material um, just because they give you so little uh, context in all of those shows uh, like uh, Kenka was I think eight minutes tip to tail but it had a full opening and ending so we ended up with about six minutes of content which translated each week to about five hours of recording um, That's nothing. now that you get 20 as a nighttime contract director um, so yeah, it was easy peasy. I had Xavier, who's one of our sound engineers, who are just the backbone mm -hmm. of our our production. Mm -hmm. um, and so I loved it. Oh my gosh! Um, 
I'm just going to take this moment to plug for them. These guys have so much knowledge on an area of this that we can only begin to speak about. Um, so if you guys, especially here, you guys are all STEM and like engineer-minded, uh, if you are interested in that side of things, let the con know to reach out to some of our sound engineers and we would both have recommendations for them. Yeah. So I know these guys would be uh, happy to come out and <coughs> talk to you about what they do. Well, at least some of them. Some of them so don't want to talk. That's yeah. why. Engineers. Um, I feel like them. Yeah. So yeah. Um, as voice directors, how much freedom do you have to like try and put your own spin on how and why a character says a particular line? And has that changed since the days before Simon does? Yes. yes. <laughs> to all of that. Oh my gosh. So um, we used to have more. Yeah. We now have less. Um, and it does become more important because you don't necessarily always know what's coming to try to stay as faithful to translation as you can, even if it doesn't make sense to you right now. Um, and then if you need to massage something later to, to make it sound more natural, you can mark that line for a pickup yep. uh, for the DVD version. Yep. But for the simulcast to make sense, you should probably err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think as a whole, it it still goes uh, from director to director. Some people are more intent yeah. on keeping it exact, like the exact wording, rather than the general meaning of the translation. But on the whole, we want to honor what we've been given. Yeah. Um, I will say, comedies are different from action and drama. Yeah, comedies get a little bit more freedom because they need to be funny, and you know, if you're staying true to the Japanese, like, what might be funny to a Japanese audience might not be funny to us at all. Right. Um, we get a lot of wordplay to um, Japanese language specific puns yeah. that uh, would not... They don't mean they, anything They to us. literally do not translate. They yeah. don't. We can't one-to-one -one that. Yeah. So, and having a big block of text on the screen that explains the joke to you is not funny either. Yeah. You know, so like... <laughs> right. And what we're going for, at least from fun. my perspective, when it comes to a dub, is an immersive uh, experience. You want it to sound as though it were meant to be spoken in English. Um, and so having something that is more recognizable to our target audience rather than having to reach for an explanation of a joke. Um, Devil is a part-timer is the first one that comes to mind for me. Has so much of that uh, just like, and this is something that I know our audience will find funny and it's meant to be really funny. Um, but yeah, we don't ever want to just scrap it and say, I can write something better here. Yeah. Um, we, we want it to be as true as we can while still sounding natural. Yeah. On, uh, on Diamond Dollar, which was the first show I ever directed uh, by myself, like solo directing, um, the uh, it's not for people under 18, I'm just going to say that right now. Uh, but uh, I had a rule that any time there was a closed mouth or mouth not shown uh, affirmation sound, like normally somebody would be like, mm-hmm, you know, or like some noise like that. I was like, every single one of these is a sassy, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, just because it's funnier, you know, because it was a comedy. Oh my God, crazy. it's ridiculous. It's so like, ridiculous. And that's another thing, is matching the level of the show. Yeah. Matching the intensity of the show, matching the in intent that was presented to you. So if you have something like that for um, Nambika, mm -hmm. uh, Tia wrote uh, for Nambika and Aaron directed, and they collaborated on that because it was so colorful, so over the top, and played to certain stereotypes that uh, for the style, Aaron wanted wherever it was in the J to take it a little further because it needed to be elevated to make sense yeah. um, stylistically. So. So yeah, uh, hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, so, as directors, you want to stay true to the intention of the original text and that entire production. Uh, so when you're first looking at that script, this might be a two-part question, but that's sure. cool. Um, when you're looking at that at that text before you actually go into the room, do you have a certain process as to getting all those different circumstances, making sure it's going to be consistent? How do you look at certain characters, or do you more 
go with the flow and see what happens as you go in there? And has your experience as as actors helped you direct things better? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so it kind of varies from show to show, and it kind of varies from writer to writer. Um, so for Darling in the Franks right now, I for right now, uh, I have two writers on the show, and. Uh, Man, when I got episode two, it could have just been a different show. Uh, the second script did not did not match anything about the first one. Like, terminology was a little bit different. Like, the way it was being written was different. Like, attitudes were different. I was just like, oh my god. And so every single week, like, I, I had a writer's meeting with them, like, over the phone and stuff, where we kind of hashed out, like, look, this is what's going on, and this is what I want you to focus on, and we need to stay really close to the translation because... Um, uh, any line could turn out to be the most important line in the show, is what I said to them. I was like, so we need to stay as close to the translation as we can. Um, on a show like Darling in the Franks, this is kind of like what Felicia was saying before, is like it varies from director to director. I feel like it varies from show to show. Like, there are some shows that I'm all about, like, yeah, take it, have fun with it, like, as long as it says the intention of the line, perfect. Darling in the Franks is one where I'm like, it better say those words! <laughs> like, because that's important and it has been numer on numerous occasions in that show and uh, so every single week I get a script from the writers and I personally go over it line by line and make sure it's as close to the translation as possible I have literally on a few occasions rewritten entire scripts of Darling in the Franks and so those guys have two days to do that I have like 12 hours if I'm lucky okay so like, that's that case, and it, it's like we said, it varies from director to director, and it varies from show to show. Um, I directed uh, Recovery of an MMO Junkie, which is a great show, um, and I didn't have to do that too much. Like, occasionally I had to, like, smooth out a line here or there as we're in the booth. It wasn't a big deal. But, like, I was already confident that the show was going to be pretty close to the translation um, and the intention of that show. Uh, so... Um, yeah, I, I, it varies a little bit, so the process on that... Um, kind of matters, but that in that case, it's also kind of good because um, it's annoying that I have to go over Darling and the Franks' script that thoroughly. But on the other hand, I know it that well. You know what I mean? Like, so when we're direct, when I'm like directing an actor, I'm like, okay, this is this thing, and this is what it means, and like, boom, boom, boom. Like, I'm never at a line in in Darling and the Franks while directing it that I'm like, what are we trying to say? What does this mean? What are we What are we thinking about? It's like, no, I know exactly what it means. Like, or at least I have some sort of concept of why it's the way it is, um, and I just go from there. So, uh... Yeah, no, very similarly, um, I think it, it, there's not really a blanket thing, but I do think that all of that stuff becomes, uh, I don't want to say instantaneous, but it is just sort of second nature. You you learn to multitask those things. So when even before you get the script, when you're watching the sub, mm -hmm. you learn to mark things mentally or take notes. Um, I'm a big proponent of that, especially when I was first starting. I just had a big I have a big Sky Wizards notebook where I would write um, as soon as a phrase came up, I would be like, "This is what we're saying." Um, and then I would check it against how are we saying it in our script and send an email and be like, are we sure this is it? Um, and that kind of stuff. Even like, um, like oh, they're saying meters instead of feet. Yeah. Um, just little things like that to try to keep solid continuity. And then eventually you do it enough that it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it goes show to show, Chaos Dragon. We had three script writers on there that yep. on a show that already is hard to make sense of. Mm -hmm. um, I love it, by the way. If you like D&D, I would watch it. I think it's charming and interesting, and the dub is real good. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chaos Dragon, yeah. It's, um, so it's like fantasy, and it is based on uh, four D&D, or four uh, anime creators playing D&D, &D, and then they made a light novel out of it, and then they made anime. Yeah, it was like Genoa Robochi and then three other people. Yeah. It was like yeah. like really well known guys. Mm -hmm. like, We're gonna read up. Yeah. And uh, it was really really fun. Um, but having three different writers on that um, made it challenging. And so I knew with that every time I got in, and that one was for DVD, luckily. So when I got in a batch of scripts, I could side by side these and like try to preemptively match 
voice for characters because that's another thing is um, one writer might see a character and interpret the way that they are acted and written in the Japanese a certain way and make them use certain language. Um, I might agree or disagree with that. And so if it were only one writer, I would write, uh, like I did for Puzzle and Dragons, and say, uh, for this show, Tiger is the only person who can say dude or bro. Nobody else can say dude or bro because that's not what I want. Um, his character can get away with it, and I think it'll be a hallmark of him. Um, and so you can have those kinds of conversations, but when you've already, they're already written and there are three different people on it, we have to make sure that Kagrava sounds weird and wacky and uh, not, you know, too haughty, not too, that he's not suddenly using elevated dialogue uh, vocabulary that he would not, he is already not used or I don't think he would use. Um, and you make those choices as you go through things and you make them in the booth once you have the actor in there because yeah. they also have valid opinions and thoughts. They, they bring that element of the character to it. And so sometimes you'll write, you'll adjust something, you'll write it, and then you have the actor in and you're like, oh snap, this is what this actually needs to be. Mm -hmm. and like, you uh, hear it. And I think you said that earlier um, that we want it to sound uh, natural spoken and heard in English and I think that's important because very often we do have the scripts in front of us and so reading something the level of comprehension you have is different from hearing it yeah. um, and you want to make sure that it what you have to say and the subtext of it is crystal clear to someone who has not read this script 500 times over the course of a single week um, but yeah, it's a, it's a multi-layered process that becomes much more fluid as you get used to it. Uh, let's go, uh, you and the purple. Um, <clears throat> have you had any shows that you are, are working on dubbing, and as you're working on it, you find that you really don't enjoy the show, or you dislike it even, and, does, and if so, does that hurt the the quality of your work or how, how do you prevent it from hurting the quality of what you end up putting out you find something to like about it mm -hmm. um, even if it's I like working with the people that I cast in this mm -hmm. um, or I really enjoy this one character's arc and I know when they show up it's gonna be good um, Greg Ayers once told me every show is someone's favorite show Yep. And so I want to, regardless of my personal taste, whether it's a show that I would normally watch or not, and I've been lucky that a lot of the shows I've gotten are shows I would watch. Um, but whether that's the case or not, I try to treat it with the same objective level of respect as every other project and uphold a standard of quality that I feel comfortable attaching my name to. Um, so, yeah, you, uh, you find things, and I don't know, the process is something I always enjoyed. I like the work. I like the day-to-day -day of it, and um, if the content happens to be great, that really, that'll bolster it. But if it doesn't, I like the people, and I like what I'm doing. Uh, my answer is the same, um, <laughs> to be honest, is, like, I've had several shows that I just outright hate it as shows, but like I found the things that I wanted to like about them. Um, we have about 15 minutes left is what it looks like, so I don't know, we'll try to, I guess maybe siphon maybe. down our answers a little bit. So uh, we we're both more. super hippie in love with what we do, so yeah. sorry so, about yeah, that. <laughs> sorry. Uh, you next, miss. Uh, how did you get into what you do and how did you start? Um, with voice directing specifically, because I think voice acting would take us a lot yeah, longer, and I do have a and a tomorrow if you guys are interested in that. Yeah, okay, great. Um, with voice directing <laughs> specifically, it was honestly um, by proxy, you. Um, because I was working on Rolling Girls, mm -hmm. uh, which was directed by Colleen Clinkenbeard, and Cliff came on uh, mid-season, early like season? episode two or three. Yeah, it was, yeah, okay. Pretty early, and he popped in during the session that I was in, and I was like, what? Because <laughs> I assume it's all about me. Yeah. Um, and Colleen was like, Cliff is going to observe, if that's cool. Just, you know, we're going to talk about the show, because uh, he's going to AD it. And by the time I got out of the booth, he had already gone. And I said, hey, that's super cool. 
And she said, do you want to do that? And I said, yeah, sure, I want to do that. And I came in like a week later, and Mike McFarland was standing in the lobby, and he said, hey, you, you interested in ADing? Because Colleen said you might be. And I said, yes. And he said, cool. And that's how I got the job. <laughs> um, but to, the, the longer of that is Colleen has been a champion for me, and she's wonderful. Uh, so the step that got to that is uh, my foresight. Uh, you remember the intuition I talked about before? It was kind of that. Uh, because when we started doing the simul dubs, the initial time, when we did Space Dandy, and then we did another, we started doing uh, Psycho Pass 2 and Laughing Under the Clouds, I was like, this is the future, this is what we're doing. And I'm like, this means that we need more directors. Because I'm like, eventually, in time, they're going to want every show that we're doing to be done like this. I could just feel it. I could feel it in the air. And uh, so Psycho Pass 2, yes, exactly. Uh, Psycho Pass 2 was directed by Zach Bolton. Zach Bolton was promoted to a producer role at the time, but he was stepping back to direct it because he had directed this first season. And so I said to him, uh, while like coming in for a session for Psycho Pass 2, um, hey, uh, what would I have to do to become a director? And uh, he was like, well, I mean, you're already script writing and like these sorts of things and having, you know, we know you're educated in it because I went to college for directing. And uh, he's like, you know, so it's something we would just kind of keep in mind if an opening came up. And uh, so that was my good foresight was so that the next season, literally, we went from doing two simul dubs to doing like 12 of them. And, uh, and that was the season where everybody got assistant directors. And so it was like me, and you, and Afia, and like other people. Other people like, I don't remember, it's changed <laughs> so much now. But so that was it. It was just really good intuition on my part that I could see the change coming, and I just tackled it. Like, so. Very quick tag on this is that um, it's all uh, preparation meeting opportunity you cannot control that opportunity but you can control the preparation for Cliff it was uh, the foresight the education and asking for what he wanted and for me it was um, having consistently shown that I was uh, interested in characters that I was reliable um, and that I could be trusted to be serious about this and so it was all of that led to being offered a thing uh, because I had proven through my actions before that it was something I'd be good at and could handle. So, yep. no matter what you want to do, always show them the best that you have yep. and, you know. Yep. Next. Green. Um, so, <clears throat> as um, directors, when it comes to casting choices, what kind of things do you have to consider? Like, if you have like veteran actors or actors you're recently taking on, um, like, you know, the genre, or just like that kind of feeling is, I know this person could do this, but I want to see if this person could do it better. Like, what kind of things do you think about um, when you're making those choices? All of that. Um, I like to think of it um, as music. I like to think of it as uh, the ensemble is like a choral ensemble, and I want harmonies. I want, um, I want interest points too. So if I have, um, you know, someone that is brash and fiery and someone who is cool and collected, I start thinking, who do I know with texture? Who do I know that's smooth? Um, who do I know? I, I also think in elements. So it's like, who do I know that's fire? Who do I know that's ice? Um, who is fire but could play ice? Um, and you just sort of stack. I would spend hours going through um, our database where we have some vocal samples. I would go to behind the voice actors because they sometimes have samples on things. I would look at who had played characters that that say you had previously played um, and who directed that uh, to see if their casting styles were similar to mine. Um, Justin Briner got a part in um, Puzzle and Dragons based on an audition he did for Chaos Dragon. Um, that was a deeper voice but I didn't have anyone that was quite there, and I could, I needed him to tent pole somewhere else. I needed his mu a different part of his range to make the music happen somewhere else. But when Puzzle and Dragons came around, I had a 14 year old who sounded like a real dude, like just a 40 year old dude, and I was like, who could do both if I needed? Based on that audition, Justin Briner, yeah. and so he got that part. Oh, 
So it's all just, um, and then there's also personal preference. Uh, people I know that I work well with, uh, people that I've been interested in working with, people who I know will sound good stacked next to each other and make each other shine. Um, it, it's hard and it was, it was never my favorite part because you always have to come down between some people and making that choice is not anything I take lightly, but I feel like the characters always find the voice they're meant to have. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. My only addition to that is uh, I would also sometimes consider similar shows. So like uh, Darling in the Franks is typically compared to being like Evangelion. Uh, Funimation dubs both. And so I was like, no one who's an Ava as like something significant is going to be something significant in Darling in the Franks. The only exception is Kent Williams, but Kent Williams' part in the Ava movies is so very small. So, um, and Kent is amazing and I love him. So like, but, <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, so that's just another little piece of it was I was like, this show is a lot like this other show. I do not want it to sound like that other show. I want it to have its own voice. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Good question. It might be a little too, one, maybe two more, super quick. Yeah, we got about eight minutes. So, uh, what you got? You have one. Okay, go for it. I have it. a very yes or no question. Are you going to get that Ichigo art signed tomorrow by the guys who drew her? By the guys who drew her? Like yeah. by the trigger guys? The trigger guys are here. Yeah, I know. I know the trigger. I met them. Uh, I met them yesterday. They're super, I, fun. They're super I nice. Yeah. Um, I don't know yet. I don't know how they would feel about signing fan art. I don't know. But uh, I don't know. I'm gonna give that to Brittany Law, who voices Ichigo in the dub. So. Um, so anyway. It's Lada, but you would think by knowing her that her name would be Lauda. So. They've also known each other for. Really yes, I've also known Brittany a very long time since she was like in high school. So anyway. Uh, cool. Uh, you have one. Yeah. Um, Considering that Crunchyroll and Funimation have a partnership, and not everything that goes on Crunchyroll gets a second dub right away, like in the case of the game, for example, mm -hmm. um, and seeing as how we're, we're seeing some old shows that um, yeah. were licensed by some like Gossip, for example, mm -hmm. uh, how much more difficult is it to do something that's been out there for much longer periods? For me, it's easier. Um, I mean, I can't, I didn't do Gossip. Right. But um, like working on, working on shows going to to DVD is easier, um, and having all of the context, having being able to sit down and watch the entire show from start to finish and know all the nuance for me is always going to be uh, just a superior time for me and initially a superior product. I think even with uh, the simuldubs having the opportunity to correct things for DVD, you end up with a project or with a product that's good, but having all of the information on the outset makes me a more productive director. Yes. <laughs> Other questions? Real quick. Come on, come on, come on. Okay. Okay, uh, so is there ever anything interesting in the transition from director to actor and then actor to director with your hectic schedules or anything like that? Or um, is it, is yeah. it being oh, to schedule, that's not my job. Poor Tara. Um, so it's not hard for me. Um, but we, we work around it. Um, for me, directing is the best thing I've ever done for myself as an actor. Mm -hmm. I got to observe. I got to think critically about it from the side of production. Um, I got to see what works and what doesn't. I got to see what I like and don't like. Um, and the only uh, difficult thing is, especially if you're working with someone who is newer, is turning off your director brain while you're acting. It's not my job while I'm in there. Um, That's super hard. Joel McDonald, uh, I had him as the lead in Sky Wizards, which was my first solo project. And he was invaluable because he came in and he said, like, I'm just here to act. And I remember I was having just a really hard time. That show was really difficult for a number of reasons. And I said, Joel, do you have any, do you have anything for this rewrite? Because he writes and directs and acts. And, for, and he was like, yeah, I can do that for you if you want. And he just did. He would just step up and like say a line. And if it was a word too long, he would immediately give it wild, rewritten. Uh, and it fit, and it was the character every time. And that man is a saint and a saving grace. Um, but he did not, he only offered when I asked. If he had come in and said, you know that's a flap too long, right? Yeah. Because I direct. 
but nobody wants that. Yeah. So uh, you just have to create clear boundaries, even if you see that something is not the way you would do it. Mm -hmm. It's someone oh, yeah. else's project. And that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> that is the thing too. Is like there's sometimes where I'm like, I wouldn't fly on my show. But, you know, I'm like, but it's your show, so it's like whatever, man. That's your call. But um, it just happens. Um, I, as a funnier answer to this, I feel like directing makes you so much better at the jokes. Like I did a joke to Colleen the other day. I had a line that's, uh, it's what's that, Deku, and. Uh, and like Deku says something and Bakugo steps up to be like blah and uh, and I went what's that Deku <laughs> and uh, and Colin was like uh, and I was like I'm kidding let's do it for real <laughs> and, like, and you get so good at thinking of funny things that are the exact same number of syllables oh yeah and like oh my god how many how many takes on Keijo did we have about Wayne Brady choking a bitch oh my god <laughs> not, not, a, not, not enough not that's true enough. but plenty of them yeah. and they always fit the flaps. So it was great, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, uh, we got about we can do like one more. You got it. Are you guys currently working on anything? Yes. Next question. <laughs> As a director, no. I uh, I stepped away from directing several seasons ago. King of Bancho was my last project, and I actually just put the last episodes of Puzzle and Dragon. Uh, to bed, so that is it for me for a while, um, just to focus up on acting, which is my foremost passion, yep. and because time yep. is very time consuming, so it's pumping the brakes. Yep. And I'm currently directing Darling in the Franks. Uh, I am directing another show, Just we just started it, but I'm not allowed to announce what it is yet. So. Ah. Voice acting, uh, yeah, I've been pretty busy lately. I think, I'm trying to think of what I can talk about. Yeah, because we're, um, we're just starting a new season, so it's really hard for us to discuss what we're yeah. talking about. So. Um, <laughs> so, for that, I think we should just say yes. Yes. We look forward to it. How so. did you get your jobs as voice actors? Uh, I went to, uh, oh, I, uh, Gosh, okay. Um, I submitted my demo to Open Call Auditions. I was on my honeymoon during Open Call Auditions. I talked so, about this earlier today. Oh my gosh. So I could not make those Open Call Auditions, but I got put back on the list because I responded in a timely manner and said I was still interested. The next thing that came up were auditions for High School DxD. I auditioned for Colleen Clink and Beard. I got cast as Rainier, and that was that. Chris Sabat recommended me, and now I have a job. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's another thing about being the best that you can be, is that there are people who will be your champions. There are people who will go to bat for you, mm -hmm. be someone that they want to go to bat for. Yep. I am. I would not have the career that I have now if it weren't for Colleen and for Mike. Yep. Um, and so, like, I, I owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude, uh, but also they would not have been interested if I had uh, not as we say in the South, had house training mm -hmm. and uh, came in and acted yeah. the fool. So, yeah. All right. I think that's it for us. Yeah, we don't really have yeah. time for another question. Thank you guys Thank so much. Thank you guys.